cage, but I can't control it. So stay away from me. The beast is ugly. As football evolved through the 20th century, so did the methods for protecting the head. The head harness morphed into a full leather helmet. By the 1930s, teams were decorating them with colorful logos, but the deficiencies of leather helmets were obvious. They became flimsy and tore, they reeked of sweat and mildew, and in the end did not provide much protection. Then, in 1939, Riddell, a Chicago company founded by a high school football coach, patented a helmet with a hard plastic shell. Mass production was delayed by World War II and a propensity of the early plastic helmets to shatter. The designer, Jerry Morgan, later Riddell's first chairman, observed that the human head is the damnedest thing to fit. It comes in all shapes and sizes, egg heads, square heads, flat heads, lopsided heads. The head isn't round, it's elongated, especially in larger heads. The NFL made helmets mandatory in 1943, and by the 1950s, the plastic helmet, ABS thermoplastic, a high-strength polymer, was widely used. But each technological advance came with a corollary, more destruction. One man's protection was another man's weapon. The face mask is but one example. The need for it was made abundantly clear by players like Hardy Brown, an undersized 49ers linebacker who liked to plunge his shoulder into the face of unsuspecting ball carriers. The humper, Brown called his signature tackle, shattered jaws and broke noses. Brown later bragged that he knocked out 75 to 80 players during his 10-year career. George Hallis once stopped a game to check Brown's shoulder pads for steel plates. But no sooner had Riddell served bolting face masks into its helmets than players figured out they could be used to wrestle men to the ground like steers. One was Dick Night Train Lane, a Hall of Famer cornerbacker for the Los Angeles Rams, Chicago Cardinals, and Detroit Lions, whose brutal tackling style became known as the Night Train Necktie. By 1956, the NFL had instituted a penalty for an entirely new term that had entered the English language, face masking. With the advent of the plastic helmet, football significantly cut down on catastrophic head injuries such as skull fractures and hemorrhages. But the flip side of that was that the human head was suddenly turned into a projectile. That dynamic in the NFL, a step forward for safety followed by ingenious forms of new mayhem, followed by more rules, continued well into the 1980s and 1990s and was very much alive when Elliot Pellman began his new helmet project in 1995. Shortly after the MTBI committee was formed, Bob Cantu, a neurosurgeon and concussion researcher in Boston, ran into Pelham and at a conference sponsored by the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Cantu had never met Pelman, who was still largely unknown among researchers, but he was struck immediately by Pelman's confidence that the NFL had a handle on the problem. I still remember Elliot waltzing into those meetings saying, we've got this committee in the National Football League and we're going to solve the concussion problem, said Cantu. Pellman described how the NFL intended to accomplish this. He said, we're going to build the best helmet imaginable, Cantu recalled. They're going to eliminate this traumatic brain injury problem with a super helmet. And it didn't matter how much it cost because the National Football League could afford anything. The creation of a concussion-resistant super helmet immediately struck Cantu as an idea both appealing and remarkably naive. The appeal was obvious. If the solution to reducing football-related concussions was tied to better equipment, the league could throw money at the problem. There's no real need to examine how the game was played or the long-term effects on the players, but Cantu felt the solution was simplistic because he did not believe better helmets could prevent concussions, which of course were injuries that occurred inside the skull. In fact, Cantu thought a new and supposedly improved helmet could make the problem worse as players became emboldened by the illusion of better protection, starting the cycle of mayhem all over again. Cantu wasn't the only one with doubts. Lovell understood the vagaries of concussion better than any member of the MTBI committee. Lovell and Collins had been cranking out their own research, and if anything, it continued to reveal how diverse and unpredictable concussions were. They defied easy solutions. Collins called it a cryptic injury. Some people recovered quickly, others needed to stay in a dark room for weeks as their brains healed. Some people seemed to be able to withstand huge amounts of trauma. With others, a slight jostling of the head might create an injury. In the MTBI committee, Lovell said he argued that helmets were fine for protecting the outside of the head. He said he thought research creating more and better protection was an interesting and certainly worthy endeavor, but the goal of engineering a super helmet to reduce concussions was not a realistic solution, he said. 
I think that's a fantasy, said Lovell. I've always thought it was a fantasy. I never thought that was a realistic thing to do. In many ways, Lovell thought the idea was understandable, the logistical creation of an exuberant rheumatologist who had been put in charge of a brain committee, and of engineers and other MTBI members who didn't spend their lives studying the myriad symptoms of traumatic brain injury. It's the fantasy of people who don't spend 50 hours a week seeing patients who are all different. But Pellman's enthusiasm was undiminished. At the end of 1999, he told the Philadelphia Daily News, Within the next six months to a year, incredible stuff is going to come out. We think we're going to be able to push the envelope. The helmet manufacturers no longer will have any excuses. We're going to understand the nature of this injury better. We think this is not only going to revolutionize headgear for football players, but across the board. And we definitely think it can have an impact on decreasing the number of concussions. Hey guys, it's Angie. So, <laughs> you guys will not believe this, but I have the football video ready for you guys. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I promised this video back around Super Bowl time, <laughs> and then things kept spiraling out, and uh, I just kept putting this video off be because there was a lot to uh, to just organize as far as how I wanted to structure this video, a lot of material to go over, and um, I have some uh, baseball themed type videos coming up in the works, so I wanted to go ahead and get this football video out there, because um, one, it's long overdue, I've been talking about it for a while, and uh, I didn't really want to get into the baseball videos until you know we had talked about this one. So for those of you who have been around a while and have heard me mention uh, doing this video, this is going to focus on the topic of CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I think I got that right. <laughs> Basically, uh, that's a medical way of saying you hit your head real good a bunch of times and now your noggin is not working so great. <laughs> uh, a lot of scary stuff is going on in there. but. That doesn't sound as professional in a medical journal, so they came up with the term CTE. And this covers that topic. And uh, this all started because I happened to come across this book, League of Denial. Um, I think I found this at like the Dollar Tree actually months and months ago and just decided to pick it up one day. I don't think I'd really heard about the topic of CTE. And then I heard about the movie Concussion starring Will Smith, which uh, talks about this topic and uh, Will Smith in the movie plays Dr. Bennett Amalu who uh, was kind of the guy who gave I mean concussions and, and head trauma and things like that they've it's been around for centuries which I'll get into um, when I talk about this in a minute but as far as the name we give it today that's a uh, pretty much attributed to him and his work after he was given uh, the autopsy of Mike Webster to do. But I'll, I'll explain all that. But before Amalu came on the scene, uh, as far as the topic of CT, I think the, the, the real discussion about it as far as a, a major problem in the NFL started happening around the 1970s. In this book, League of Denial, they go into uh, talking about the time period. Everything is sort of spun around the case of Mike Webster. And so uh, the research is sort of built around his colleagues and the people he played with during the time period. And uh, he played during the uh, I think it was the 70s and 80s, if I remember right. Yeah, uh, and so they start with that period and look at what football look, looked like back then because I think it's no big secret that when football started with the days of the leather helmets and stuff, it's it, it was kind of it's kind of a given now that we know that that was a really unsafe time to play. Because like like that intro passage I read said, it, that thin piece of leather doesn't do much for your head. So um, 
the real investigation started with uh, the 1970s and maybe even a little bit earlier, maybe the late 60s, when we had progressed into the thick plastic helmets and people were still starting to show signs of, of head traumas and things were starting to show up off the field as far as um, mood changes and behavioral changes and, and things like that. And so that's when people really started to ask, is there something going on with this sport that all these guys are coming out and having these issues? But even back then, the NFL was saying, ah, it's probably not that big a thing. It's fine. It's fine. And uh, for the long time, the standard way to deal with this was to basically just tell players to shake it off. The, the coaches and the team doctors, they would give them smelling salts and you know, do the how many fingers am I holding up and say, oh yeah, you seem good, okay, go ahead, go back out. <laughs> and not a lot of research was put into it. And they might look at them after the game, but by then the damage is already kind of done. And uh, so it wasn't taken seriously, so it wasn't treated seriously. And so the problems kept progressing. Before I get into Amalu, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about the period we're talking about as far as the 70s and 80s when we uh, first looked at this this problem. Let's start with with Mike Webster and uh, I'll kind of go from there to give you a, a few more examples. But with Mike Webster, he uh, got the nickname in the NFL Iron Mike. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers and he was just known as a really dedicated player, um, was almost fanatical about his training because he came from this poor background, um, not a lot of money in his family. So when he got into the NFL and he was married and he had his own family to look after, he became just sort of singularly driven to make sure that they were always cared for. And uh, he went kind of crazy <laughs> with his training because he was so fearful that things were gonna fall apart. And so I was just going to give you an example they gave in here of, of this sort of fanatical training I'm talking about. He pushed himself so hard um, as far as football training and getting into the NFL that uh, his rookie year, the Steelers ended up going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> First year out and he goes to the Super Bowl. Now, I'm not saying that he was solely responsible for that happening, obviously, but it was just, you know, kind of a, a nice commingling of hard work and luck and good timing that he got to experience that his very first year. But um, he did take it as, you know, it doesn't stop there. You have to keep training. You have to stay on top of your game. And so he goes home and says, I'm going to go home and get bigger. But at this point, they're talking about uh, when Webster returns for his second season, his teammates and his coaches and everybody are just shocked <laughs> at the transformation his body has had. I think in this it said when he was first drafted, they believe he weighed around 215. When he came back for season two, he had bulked up to around 250, 260. It said, by then, Webster's dedication to his training had become so maniacal that in hindsight, his closest friends wondered if it wasn't a sign of insecurity so profound that it was almost a sickness. On most days, Webster could be found in the basement of a Pittsburgh State House, the Red Bull Inn in McMurray, a suburb south of the city. John Kolb had gotten to know the manager, a powerlifting fanatic named Lou Karinga, who had turned the restaurant's boiler room into a gym. It was a lifter's dungeon, windowless and stifling, the air thick with the smell of sweat and athletic tape. Kolb recruited Webster and several other Steelers in what he called the 500 Club, players who could bench press 500 pounds. The Red Bull Inn became Webster's second home, so central to his life that he and Pam moved closer to McMurray to cut down on his commute. Webster often brought his training home with him. In the winter, he would head out in the knee-deep snow with a barbell behind his head and do lunges. When the snow thawed, he'd put on shoulder pads and a helmet and hammer against a blocking sled he kept in his yard. Craig Wolfley, a dealer's offensive lineman, pulled up at Webster's house early one morning to find Webster in a helmet, shoulder pads, and spikes pushing a sled across the yard, 
at 6.30 in the morning. I said, Webby, do you know how crazy this looks? Wolfley joked that Webster could hook up the blocking sled to a lawnmower to kill two birds with one stone. Webster pounded his blocking sled so often it carved a trench in the yard. Sometimes his youngest son, Garrett, hopped on for the ride. Webster's training regimen included anabolic steroids. Decades later, this would be a matter of debate in some circles, but the evidence was conclusive. Most notable was Webster's own admission. At least two reports in his lengthy medical file contained references to steroids. In 1993, less than three years after Webster retired, a Pittsburgh doctor reported he took anabolic steroids for a very short time when he was in his 20s. Another report in 1993, based on one doctor's conversation with Webster, asserted that he only rarely experimented with, with steroid use during his playing career. It goes on to say that by 1976, he had bulked up again to 270 pounds, increasing his body weight by roughly 25%, almost all of it muscle. By 1980, he was literally the strongest man in the game. One of his teammates said he had arms like legs and legs like people. So, yeah, crazy big guy. Um, just really dedicated to the game, partly because he was dedicated to his family, but he also was known for really liking the game and um, liking being part of a team. And in his early days, he was kind of known as being, you know, a nice guy, a little bit of a jokester, a little bit of a prankster. And then the further along he got in his career, the more trauma he took to his head, the more people started to see his, his personality shift. And uh, then I think he, it was the early 90s, I believe it was, they said he retired. And it just spiraled downhill really fast from there. He had some financial problems before he left the NFL, but... I think when he when he decided to retire, it just he tried all these different things that weren't really working out. At that point, people didn't really know too much about the topic of CTE, so people just thought he was losing his mind. But he, his finances started to go down the toilet. Uh, his marriage was was on the rocks. He started having some serious uh, mood swings. It got to the point where he just, he ended up losing his dream house that he had worked so hard to get with his family. He said he lost his storage unit that had all his stuff, so he ended up living in his truck by the railroad tracks. Either that or he would bounce around to um, to bus stations, crash there for, for a night here or a night there. Started having more and more pain. And that's the crazy thing is he mentioned multiple times during his career of issues with pain, but uh, when the uh, Fanru brothers looked into this, they, they went through all these records and discovered that in his official, in, a, in Mike Webster's official NFL record, there were only two instances of uh, concussions being documented in like an 18 year career, uh, two two concussions in nearly 18 years of playing football that's that doesn't add up but that's what his medical file said but nfl doctor had documented other things as far as like low blood sugar and dizziness minor injuries like that but no connections were ever made it was just one incident documented after another and i don't know it just kind of struck me as like a lot of the NFL players that were, or NFL doctors that were working during Webster's time were kind of phoning it in a lot of, it seemed like there was very little actual medical <laughs> record keeping being done. It was just like, yeah, they seem fine, go ahead. And in here they talk about how during his time there was also a rule that doctors could not take players off the field. So they might have been fighting against that. Um, my husband follows football a lot better than I do. Um, I asked him about that and he said that he believes that since then the NFL has done away with that and obviously players are taken off the field when they're injured because you see that during gameplay. Um, so he doesn't think that's really a rule anymore. Um, but they give you examples in here of the things that the NFL used to do before they were more 
dedicated to taking injured players off the field. And one of the things that <laughs> struck me was they had an example of um, players being lined up before a game or um, or during half times, and uh, they would take all the injured players, basically tell them to bend over and hit them all in the butt with shots of Toradol, and then send them back out in the field. <laughs> Uh, and figured that was good enough. Um, so it's not really shocking that uh, these traumas ended up causing so many problems for guys down the road. That was what uh, Mike Webster was looking at. During his era, there was also a popularity in the field drill, the Nutcracker, which uh, th this, this was a drill that had been endorsed by coaches like um, Bill Belichick, who is still an NFL coach, and uh, Vince Lombardi. And uh, if I remember right, I think that's the play where you have two players laying on the ground, and one has the ball, one doesn't. And in this nutcracker thing, you're supposed to, both players are supposed to pop up and basically run at each other and try to take each other down. As but. The thing that's promoted in this is to try to hit them as hard as you can to knock them down. And uh, in this book they talk about the people that w would sit there during NFL games and witness this actually likened it to uh, like Roman <laughs> battles, uh, like gladiator battles, or even cockfighting. That it got very vicious very fast. But coaches were endorsing it because they were saying, oh, well, it separates the men from the boys and it shows us who can take a hit kind of thing. Um, but even something simple like that, like just training drills being done over and over and over again, um, when it was investigated down the road, they thought, they started to think that even something like that, it didn't have to be official gameplay, it's just something simple like a training drill that seems so innocuous, even that was causing problems because you're doing it over and over again and you're getting hit over and over again. And then <laughs> there were other cases that are documented in this book where they talk about um, players being hit so hard that they actually sharded themselves. There was one player that uh, said he actually forgot his plays mid-game he actually went out onto the field to play and his mind went completely blank and he just burst into tears and ran off the field. And that's not... That's not normal. <laughs> when you see players doing... That's not a normal human reaction to burst into tears. That should have been a sign that, okay, maybe he's getting hit in the head a lot. Um, maybe we should look at this, but... <sighs> I don't know, it's just, when you read books like this, it's crazy because you think there are so many obvious signs once it's all put together in front of you and you're just shocked that people were so blasé about it and not really noting it. All of these coaches in the NFL, all these medical doctors, and nobody was catching this, or if they were, they were putting the safety of the players underneath the amount of money the players were bringing in. It's just, that's crazy and sick. <laughs> there was even one linebacker in this book that was quoted as saying, it's not really a good game unless your hand gets stepped on or if, and it's not really a good game if nobody leaves bleeding. <laughs> they also cover um, some of the incidents that happened with uh, Troy Aikman's career. They talk about Aikman's, um, what they call the season of concussion, where um, earlier in this one particular year, uh, Aikman was hit by a linebacker, 240-pound linebacker. The guy hit Aikman so hard on the helmet that uh, Aikman ended up having his tongue lacerated inside his helmet, and they said he collapsed on the field went out for a second and when he came to again he didn't even realize there was a football game going on the only thing he could remember was that it was sunday he didn't know where he was and know what was going on and they thought that <laughs> they thought oh that was bad enough but then it got worse because later that year i think it was the same year uh aikman's team goes to the super bowl 
He gets injured again to the point where he has to be hospitalized. I think that was before he had actually gone to the Super Bowl game. Uh, but he was in, he was watching, he was in the hospital watching a game of his team and his agent was there. And um, his agent <laughs> got suspicious when he realized he was having the same conversation with Eggman, like almost identical question and answer period, three or four times, like right after each other, Eggman would ask a question and he'd answer and then just a few minutes later, he'd ask the same exact question the same exact way and he'd answer. And he would have no memory of having this conversation already. And um, there were just all these cases of these players going through this. One linebacker in here, it got so bad for him, he retired from the NFL at the age of 29. He just decided to cut ties and be like, mm-mm. Then it progressed into this point where uh, some of the players, some of the NFL doctors did start to be concerned the more and more they saw these injuries happening and the after effects like the um, amnesia and, and uh, mood changes and things like that and they, they did start to worry about well are these players going to have dementia down the road. So some of these NFL doctors, uh, they came forward and they tried to put a project together where they interviewed a bunch of NFL players and um, tried to see just how bad the situation was. And they were what they were going for the first time around was they were trying to see if they could get enough medical information together to try to get these players and maybe even ex-NFL players at that point, try to get them lifetime medical insurance. But what they ended up finding was these players were so banged up that they didn't qualify for most of the medical coverage programs out there. Um, so they, did, they couldn't figure out how to get these guys covered, how to help their families get covered. The problem just seemed to get worse in the 90s because by the 1990s, the trend in the NFL was make them bigger, faster, tougher, stronger, you know, make them bulletproof. And so the guys that were in, NFL, in the NFL then, they were relying even more on just crazy training regimes and uh, some were even relying on steroid use. And it just, it got insane with this obsession with trying to have these guys built like tanks and the guys themselves got caught up in it because you know they had families to support and they didn't want to lose their places on the team so they did what they had to do something mentioned in in this book where they said that um, during that time players were actually prohibited from using the term brain damaged if they were ever interviewed about any injured players which uh, sounded suspicious to me that the NFL would put that in there that says don't use that term. So, like, so you do know there is a problem. <laughs> and then uh, by 2001, these, this team of neurosurgeons got together and they realized part of the problem might be that there were even some doctors who didn't know how to specifically define what a concussion was far as within the NFL, what counted as a concussion. There was no real clear-cut answer for that. This team of doctors was saying maybe maybe that had to do with <laughs> a little bit why uh, these injuries were getting overlooked because nobody was going by the same laid out definition of, um, of injury. So they looked into that. They sent out nearly 4,000 packets of uh, questionnaires to um, everybody on the former or retired NFL roster. And these were just questions that basically asked them to lay out all the injuries they could remember, any current issues they were having, um, if they remembered feeling like they had a concussion and maybe it was being ignored. Like they just wanted full medical history as best as they could get from these guys. Out, out of all the ones they sent out of that 4,000, uh, 2,552 or 69% came back 
So they took that information and unfortunately <laughs> combined with that information, they also did a little bit of animal testing uh, as far as learning brain trauma, which I didn't know this was going on, but they said when they did go to outline what all entailed a concussion, it said, um, the guidelines were based on previous experiments that had examined the effect of mild brain traumatic injury, the medical term for concussion. In one series of early experiments, professors at Wayne State University dropped dogs, pigs, pregnant baboons, and human cadavers down an elevator shaft to study the effects of concussions. In another experiment, a researcher put metal helmets on monkeys and applied pneumatic arms, which were propelled back and forth rapidly, violently shaking the monkeys' heads. The monkeys were then euthanized and their brains were cut out to examine the effect. So, it's tragic that they had to go that route, but the little good that did come out of that was that they did get a better finding of of what damage ha actually happens to the brain. So yeah, not the ideal way to get there, but hesitate to say their hearts were in the right place, but kind of. Um, these doctors were trying to find out how to help these guys. We got to the end of it. They defined a concussion as, a concussion is a blow to the head followed by a variety of symptoms that may include any of the following. Headache, dizziness, loss of balance, blurred vision, seeing stars, feeling in a fog or slowed down, memory problems, poor concentration, nausea, or throwing up. Getting knocked out or being unconscious does not always occur with a concussion. That's what they gave the NFL to work off of and said, you know, if, if your player is complaining of any of these things, stop <laughs> and investigate them. Ask them questions. Don't just ignore it and send them out. So what was the NFL's response to this? The NFL put together their own committee. These neurosurgeons that put this, this together, uh, they weren't necessarily attached to the NFL or on a, the NFL payroll because if they were, the NFL probably would have silenced them. The NFL put together their own medical committee full of doctors that were on their payroll. So you can imagine how much more preferable those doctors' results are, would have been. But the uh, committee that the NFL put together was known as the MTBI Committee or Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee, or MTBIC, I guess it, I should say. It was also around the same time that uh, Lee Steinberg, the sports agent, who uh, he, would, he was known for being a, a sports agent to a lot of um, well-known players and, and celebrity athletes. Uh, he was also the, the um, advisor for the film, Jerry Maguire. He sort of spearheaded this project to get uh, all these seminars going to try to educate the, the NFL coaches. Uh, and, and players that wanted to know about what their findings were with all these neurosurgeons that, uh, like I said, were not on NFL payroll that honestly wanted to help the players. Uh, he was putting together all these seminars, but in the end, it didn't look like it was really doing much good at that point. When you read this, you start to see that in the background for all these decades, there were these like little trickle movements of people here and there that were trying to get through the bureaucracy of the NFL and try to push through um, their tendency to stifle things uh, that made them look bad. Um, there were people there that were trying to get help for the players, but the NFL is a powerful corporation that makes millions and millions of dollars a year, so um, they're used to having their way. So a lot of things just got silenced uh, about until the time Omalu came on the scene, which was in the early 2000s. And Dr. Bennett Omalu came on. He actually didn't follow football. <laughs> he was a Nigerian doctor that came to the U.S. to uh, study um, forensics and pathology, and, and um, he took up a job as a coroner. 
and one of the autopsy cases he was assigned happened to be Mike Webster. And when he first got Mike Webster, he had no idea who the guy was. He was just fascinated with the his findings because he took it as just a regular case in his caseload that day. <laughs> and uh, when he read about what was being said about Mike Webster immediately before Webster's death, the way um, Webster was uh, having extreme bouts of paranoia. He, he was huffing ammonia to stay awake because he was scared to fall asleep. He was um, treating pain by using a taser gun and shooting it in areas of pain to try to, to cancel out the pain. He started to show early signs of dementia. According to his sons, um, he was having episodes where he was forgetting how to brush his teeth or tie his shoelaces. There was even one incident where one of his sons found him urinating in the refrigerator. People talked about how uh, Webster had destroyed pictures of himself from the NFL. He didn't want memories of that time. And he also, in his worst times, would uh, make death threats against people that he thought had ruined his career in the last years prior to his death, he was fighting the NFL to try to get disability money. And I think that's one of the aspects of his story that broke my heart the most was that he went from being a near multimillionaire um, for the money he was being paid during his time in the NFL. He went from being a near multimillionaire to begging basically to get disability money and he went through a I think they said 10 year struggle just to get disability pay. Nobody would listen to him for like a decade and when he finally got it it was only like $650 a month to live off of and they said by that time he was showing advanced stages of dementia, um, advanced stages of paranoia and it's just he, he was it seemed clear that he was nearing the end of the road. And when Umalu read about all this, he compared that to what he was actually finding in Webster's body and it wasn't making sense. Webster ended up dying officially of heart failure at the age of 50. But when Umalu went to uh, do the autopsy, what he found was that there wasn't really trauma on the body to correlate with the behavior Webster, according to people that knew him, was displaying immediately before his death. The, the body looked pretty normal. The brain looked pretty normal. And that's what Omalo got fascinated with. He said, this doesn't make sense. If the guy was that bad before his death, why isn't it showing up in his, in his body? And so, um, he got permission to hold on to Webster's brain. He uh, held it in storage for about a month, I think, and then went back because he said he needs to think about this and try to figure it out. And when he went back and started doing slides of uh, brain fragments on, on his microscope, that's when, over time, he started to realize what was going on. And he discovered that it had to do with an overproduction of this protein in the brain called tau. From what I understand, everybody has a small amount of this protein in their brain naturally. The problem is when you get an overproduction of it, it, it starts to make these neurofibrillary uh, bundles on your brain, which they're basically like knots and they start to kill off the brain cells. They start to strangle them out and your brain cells start dying off and that's when people start displaying the behavioral changes like you know the paranoia and the um, signs of rage, um, bad financial decisions, marriages busting up, um, early signs of dementia, all that stuff comes from these brain cells being killed off. So it was, <laughs> it was sort of a breakthrough for him. And then it just so happened that when he's studying this case, he starts getting other NFL players being brought to the coroner's office. And he starts doing 
other autopsies on on NFL players, and he's finding the same results. He after he discovered what was going on with Webster's brain, he starts to look for that in other players' brains and starts to find it again and again. It's from there and starts to investigate uh, and starts to interview surviving family members and friends and, and former players. And that's when he starts to build his case again about um, this CTE condition. And to solidify his, his, his case, he even goes back further and lays out the history of uh, this, uh, this uh, syndrome called um, uh, Dementa Pugilista, I think is what it is, um, or Punch Drunk Syndrome, which is uh, this condition that's often found in boxers from getting hit in the head a lot. And he said, you know, this dates back for ages. And the symptoms looked like they were almost identical from what was happening in boxers to what was happening in football players. So Amalu took all of his information, this was like you know, months in the making, when he put it all together, he submitted it to Neurosurgery Medical Journal. When people first heard about it, it, it for the most part, it was pretty well received. People found it pretty interesting, but it didn't take long for the NFL to come back and demand a retraction. And um, I just thought I would read you the part where it talks about him being notified that the NFL wants him to retract the, the article. The paper was published as a special report in the July 2005 issue of Neurosurgery. After a brief period of deceptive calm, Omalu received a call from a man who identified himself as Donald Marion, a member of Neurosurgery's editorial board. Marion told Omalu that doctors from the NFL's MTBI committee were calling for his paper to paper to be retracted. You know what that means, what that would mean for your career? Marion said. Umalo knew. He sat down and wept. He knew that in the world of scientific research, a demand for a retraction was the nuclear option. It generally was reserved for allegations of fraud, plagiarism, or cheating. I haven't done anything wrong, Umalo pleaded. Marion said he had been asked by Apuzo to mediate the dispute. He told Amalo that he would receive a copy of the NFL's demand and that he should confer with his co-authors to put together a response. That evening, Amalo emailed Dukoski and Hamilton, the two co-authors of, of his paper, summarizing the conversation. Amalo indicated that he had the impression that Marion believed the demand was without merit and might have been directed by league office. Interestingly, he thinks their paper is laughable and politically motivated. Um, Omalu wrote to his colleagues. He has asked me, however, to write up a very simple scientific explanation without being, without becoming political. He said they all know that it was the NFL that may have instructed Dr. Pellman and his group to pen the commentary. Despite Marion's reassurances, Omalu was terrified. As he prepared to read the NFL letter at his Pittsburgh apartment, he poured himself a shot of Johnny Walker Red and gulped it down. The letter was signed by the three leading members of the MTBI committee, Elliot Pellman, Ira Casson, and Dave Viano. We disagree with the assertion that Amalo et al.'s recent article actually reports a case of chronic traumatic encephalopathy in a National Football League player. The letter began. We base our opinion on two serious flaws in Umalo's, um, Umalo et al.'s article namely a serious misinterpretation of their neuropathological findings in relation to the tetrad characteristics of chronic traumatic encephalopathy and a failure to provide an adequate clinical history. These statements are based on a complete misunderstanding of the relevant medical literature on chronic traumatic encephalopathy of boxers, dementia pugilista, and a, a review of the relevant medical a review of the relevant medical literature, including that cited by Omalo et al. in the chronological order in which it was published, demonstrates the flaws in Omalo et al.'s assertions. As Omalo read on, he began to relax. By the time I got to the third paragraph, I smiled, he recalled. I even laughed. I knew that Pellman, Casson, and Viano did not know the subject and that their letter was embarrassing and shameful. I said to myself, isn't it un-American? I respect this country, I'm a foreigner, but I came here to chase my dreams. That the three doctors who are the heads of the NFL Brain Injury Committee don't even know the basic science of brain damage. 
I became angry. The letter was six pages long, longer than even the original paper, much of it a scientific overview of the history of CTE and boxers. Pellman, Casson, and Viano used phrases such as complete misunderstanding, completely wrong, and completely lacking. They made two primary arguments, that Omalo et al. had a case that didn't meet the criteria for CTE, that there weren't, and, there, and that there wasn't enough clinical evidence showing Webster was mentally impaired. They insisted Omalo's findings met only one of the four standards necessary to call it CTE, even though Omalu and his colleagues had never claimed that this was identical to what was found in the boxers. NFL doctors suggested that the clinical history on Webster was essentially useless because it had been limited to a few phone calls with family members. They pointed out that Webster had no history of concussion or any indication that he had ever left a game because of the blow to the head. Amalu et al. goes on to state that there was no known history of brain trauma outside of professional football. And in fact, there was no known history of brain trauma inside professional football, they wrote, suggesting that during his 17-year career in the NFL, there was no evidence that Webster's brain was so much as jostled. Hassan, Pellman, and Viano suggested alternative theories for what might have happened to Webster's brain, theories that the league would continue to cite for years, alcohol, steroids, possible drug use. Ironically, the theories were reminiscent of those proposed by defenders of boxing after Martland, like Omalu, a medical examiner, described punch drunk syndrome in boxers in 1928. We have demonstrated that Omalu et al.'s case does not meet the clinical or neuropathological criteria of CTE, they wrote. We therefore urge the authors to retract their papers or sufficiently revise it and its title after more detailed investigation of this case and they all, uh, Casson, Pellman, and Biano all sign it. And then it goes on to say, the doctors didn't identify their connection to the NFL as they were merely independent physicians who had banded together in their outrage. Omalu wondered about their backgrounds. He did some quick research and had to laugh. Pellman, the committee chairman, and now one of Omalu's main critics, was a rheumatologist. The head of the NFL's brain committee was an arthritis expert? When he finished, Omalo emailed Hamilton, Hamilton and Dukoski. To, see it, to say the least, it is a laughable commentary, he said. So, he goes back and forth with these guys, um, but also around the same time, there are cases of um, the NFL being taken to court over and over again. Uh, one of these cases in, I think it was 2005 or... No, 2007, uh, a hearing was held that was called the Oversight in NFL Retirement Systems. Mike Webster's son, Garrett, came in to testify, and he says, he asked if anyone in the room had any idea what it was like to shock one's father with a taser to alleviate his pain, or if they had experienced receiving a desperate phone call from their dad saying he was about to kill himself to escape the unending torture or if they had watched a once proud strong man like Mike Webster beg for Kentucky Fried Chicken. But it was Garrett's story about how his father missed his 10th birthday without so much as a phone call. A man who once called him practically every night before bed that left everyone in the room pondering the future of pro football. Later that month I found out why, Garrett told the wrapped committee members. When our family discovered Iron Mike Webster bloated to over 300 pounds, shivering naked in a bed in a rat-infested motel, and at his side were not pictures of his kids, not his Super Bowl rings, nor even autographs or any glory that you associate with football, but a bucket of human waste because he was too weak to make it to his bathroom. It was followed by former player Brent Boyd, who had played six seasons as an offensive offensive guard with the Minnesota Vikings before retiring in 1986. Boyd had been looking forward to the opportunity to testify. It was his chance to tell the nation's policymakers and by extension the public his story. I do have brain damage, Boyd began. He asked the committee to please indulge his invisible disability, which mostly affected him when he was under stress. Boyd explained that he had been diagnosed with football-induced brain damage in 1999. He said that he had been advised by a member of the disability board not to bother filing a claim because the NFL owners would never open that can of worms by approving a claim for a head injury. The NFL's schizophrenic policy on concussions was beyond confusing at this point. 
The league had set up the 88 plan for retired players with dementia, and the retirement board had distributed benefits to at least some players with brain damage. Yet, its official concussion committee, co-chaired by a neurologist universally known as Dr. No, continued to deny the connection between football and brain damage. While players like Brent Boyd testified under oath about what they had perceived as a conspiracy, Boyd likened the NFL to the tobacco companies fighting against the link between smoking and cancer. He alleged that the NFL had destroyed his medical files. His disability claim, he said, had been denied by the board, even though multiple doctors had supported it. One man took particular issue with Boyd's testimony. His name was Dave Dwerson, and he was also a witness that day. Dwerson had spent 11 seasons as a defensive back in the NFL, mostly with the Chicago Bears. He had earned a reputation as one of the game's fiercest hitters. After retiring, he became a highly successful businessman so popular in Chicago that local power brokers recruited him to run for office. During his playing days, Dorson was a player representative and took the job seriously, an extension of a childhood that included standing in picket lines with his father, who spent 38 years working for General Motors and was active in the United Work Auto Workers. Dorson had been one of the named plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit that had led to free agency in the NFL. After his final season, he stayed active with the union, eventually becoming so close to its director, Gene Upshaw, that some people viewed him as an heir apparent. Upshaw made Dorson an alternative trustee on the disability board, and Dorson eventually became a voting member on disability claims such as Brent Boyd's, although it wasn't clear how he voted on that case. During the question-and-answer period, Boyd testified that NFL players were never warned that concussions could destroy their lives. Borson became the league's defense. There was no indication, he said, that the football caused brain damage. His own father, he pointed out to the committee, has Alzheimer's and brain damage but never played a professional sport. So the challenge, you know, in terms of where the damage comes from is a fair question. Dorson's defense of the NFL infuriated his fellow former players. They found his argument that his father had brain damage but hadn't played in the NFL bizarre and another indication that he was a sellout, protecting the interests of the league. When Dorson walked out of the hallway after his testimony, he got in a screaming match with Hall of Fame linebacker Sam Huff and Bernie Parrish, a former Cleveland Browns defensive back. Both players were critical of Upshaw, Dorson's mentor. Dorson was spewing profanities at Huff and Parrish, Boyd told the writer Irvin Mucknick, who ran the blog Concussion Inc. He said, what the fuck do you know about the Players Union? He was acting like he wanted to fight them physically. Parrish said he accidentally bumped Dorson during the melee, but Dorson thought it was intentional. Dorson had been charged with assaulting his wife in 2005 and more recently had run into financial problems. But to most people who knew him, screaming at a pair of respect former players in the halls of Congress wasn't like him. It was an extreme reaction out of character. No one had yet put it together that Dave Dorson, defender of the NFL, denier of football-related brain damage, was also losing his mind. The book goes on to talk about how Dorson himself ends up being a uh, victim of CT, he goes down a long road and, um, like they said, I mean, starts to lose his mind. And um, I think by, it was 2011, they said, uh, he, I think it was in Miami, was in his hotel and um, decided to commit suicide. But in his suicide note, he left instructions for his brain to be left to the brain bank at the University of Boston, I think it is. And uh, the brain bank is where they have a place where they um, collect uh, brains of NFL players that uh, want to, they, you, you know, you leave lasting uh, will that says you you want your brain to be studied after your death to see if you have CT. If you put in that request as an NFL player, your brain gets sent to the brain bank and they study it. Um, and so a lot of what we do know about CT now has come from those donated brains. And uh, in the case of both Dave Dorson and Junior Seau, who both committed suicide, they both shot themselves in the heart so that their brain wouldn't be damaged and they both asked that their brains be studied for CTE. And <laughs> there was another thing that struck me as kind of sad in this book where they talk about 
um, when Dorison was in college, he went to Notre Dame. And um, I guess he was playing both baseball and football because they said he was drafted by the um, Dodgers and instead decided to play NFL. And so I just wonder, you know, <laughs> what what his life might have been as far as like being different um, if he had decided to play fo baseball instead of football. Uh, not that you don't have head injuries in, in baseball, but it doesn't seem to be quite as epidemic as it does in, in football. Also that same year when uh, Dorson decided to commit suicide, the NFL was taken to court yet again by 75 uh, former football players who wanted to testify against them. And then being a uh, former Atlanta Falcons safety Ray Easterling. I was going to tell you what he said in, in his testimony. The litany of Easterling's problems was now painfully familiar. Mood swings, inattentiveness, business failures, erratic behavior. Easterling's hands shook. He had impulsive urges to run for miles in the dark or to chop wood, which he stacked in his driveway in Richmond, Virginia. Once, while chopping, he accidentally took off part of his thumb. Eight months after the lawsuit was filed, Eastern Lee shot himself to death at the home he shared with his wife of 36 years. He was 62. His brain, it was later discovered, was riddled with CTE. By the time the results were released after the first lawsuit, more than 3,000 retired players and their relatives were suing the National Football League. Nearly one quarter of all living former NFL players, and counting. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think I'd mentioned it previously in this video, but um, one of the tough things about CTE uh, to date, doctors say that it's, it's I, as far as I know, it still can't be officially determined until after death. Um, you can have recognizable symptoms and they can suspect it's CTE, but um, I think because you have to study the brain proteins, the tau, in the brain. It, I'm guessing it's hard to do that when a person is still living um, unless they, you know, <laughs> I don't know if there's a way you could take a sample but that's kind of hard to do when a person's living to go tinkering around in the brain. So I think that's why they say um, it needs to be done after death um, but that's that's a tricky thing is you don't know for sure until pretty much until it's too late. I had another part of this I wanted to talk about a different book I was sent um, I was sent for a review that also covers this topic, but, but I am running out of storage uh, on my memory card, so I'm going to cut this and uh, give you guys a part two shortly, so stay tuned and we'll continue.